this is Inspiring Design, where unique innovators come together to share their knowledge, share their insight, and keep us up to date with the latest industry trends. And here's your host, Rushan Senanayak. What's up, listeners? Welcome to Season 4 of Inspiring Design with Rushan Senanayak. This is where the best of the best brands, experts, change makers, and thought leaders come together to share their valuable insights, experience, and knowledge, all centered around the growth sector in advanced manufacturing within Industry 4.0, encompassing various industries, technologies, skills, knowledge, trends, as well as stakeholders, all the while linking it back into education, within schools and universities. What's up listeners? Today's episode is a featured cornerstone and is the talk of 2023, AI. But this time we're using AI to measure the unmeasurable. So joining me today is Dr. Paul Browning, the headmaster of St. Paul's School here in Brisbane. Paul has been a school principal for over 24 years, leading two large independent schools one in ACT and St. Paul schools here in Queensland. Dr. Browning's PhD being in leadership, specifically in cultures of trust that enable innovation and organizational improvement. In 2018, Paul was named the school principal of the year, non-governmental at the Australian Education Awards. And in 2019, St. Paul school was named as the Australian school of the year an episode to remember so without further ado let's get straight into it all right all right paul thank you so much for being here and uh, this is an exciting episode and we've got a lot to talk about but before we do can we start off with a little bit of background of yourself what's your story to date sure well i actually uh, began my teaching career as a kindergarten teacher would you believe it so wow. I, I trained as a primary teacher back in the late 80s mm-hmm. and i landed my first job in 1990 at a small school in new south wales called jibgate primary school where's that been? uh that's in mittagong new south wales just right. near barrel yep. uh, and my first class i had jimmy barnes's uh, one of jimmy oh, wow. barnes's kids i yep. had billy uh, birmingham 12th man yeah a fame uh, i've taught mark opitz's kids who produced in excess as well yeah so it's a real opening to my career in terms of being able to teach those yeah. kids and be a kindergarten teacher as, as a bloke. Uh, that was a bit daunting. So yeah, I yeah. spent about eight years there. I was the early childhood coordinator just before I left. Mm-hmm. Then I was appointed the founding head of a new school in Canberra called Bergman Anglican School. Mm-hmm. And I grew Bergman from 24 students to just under a thousand in 10 years. Wow. And we had a waiting list of 3,000 and about to open a second campus. Uh, and when I came here to St Paul's School in the middle of 2008, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. here I am today. You, um, I have to ask this question, are you a blue supporter or a maroon supporter? I thought you were going to ask, so how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad you've asked the better question. I'm a blue supporter. Blue here supporter, I am. right. And it's state of origin, Rochelle. Yep, like, yep. I was born in New South Wales. Fair. I was raised in New South Wales. Fair. So I've got blue in my blood. But you so. are kind of batting for the Maroons at the moment, though. A little no, bit. no, definitely not. I would never, ever do that. Well, so. you're, you're sitting across from a Maroons fan. Are you so serious? We don't need to oh, get into okay. that. Okay, so we're going to get. <laughs> I think we're leading down the wrong path of what yeah, we're supposed to be talking bit. about. But um, no, look, that's an exciting education career. And um, I can imagine the work you're doing here that we've all we've witnessed is a very small portion, but it's been impressive. So I want to talk about artificial intelligence. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a topic of the month, almost topic of the year, maybe. Um, but at a high level, what, how do you see artificial intelligence affecting education now and the future? Well, my, my hope is it's finally going to actually shake education up mm-hmm. uh, and cause people to rethink how we prepare our young people for an uncertain future. Mm-hmm. Uh, for about 10 years at St Paul's School, we've been seeing this coming mm-hmm. and we've been transforming the way we educate young people here so we are actually equipping them with the skills and dispositions they need to thrive in an uncertain future. A world dominated by AI yep. and finally ChatGPT arrives on the scene and everyone starts knocking on our door going, uh, 
say, hang on, yep. you've been saying this for a long time. And I'm yep. going, yes, thank you, chat GPT. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And just so the listeners are aware of like, we, uh, in terms of timing, Revision 4 just came out. So yes, I saw that, month, yeah. producer videos. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's just going to get better and better, really. Like That's yep. the scary part about yep. uh, AI is we, we think this is it and what the end product actually is. No, the more data it gets fed, mm -hmm. uh, the more it will you know, do amazing things. And I can tell you what, next month there'll be something else that comes out that's even better and amazes us even more. Absolutely, and yeah. I think that's the, that's almost the scary part for a lot of people because of the fact that it's evolving so, so quickly. Yeah. Since since it's almost blew up and I think one million users, that was about two months ago yeah. from memory. Uh, now it's in revision four, doing some incredible things. I've heard people doing their tax returns completely on their platform, yeah. and uh, some people actually coding their entire script for an app in ChatGPT now. So that's evolving a whole bunch of careers in a very quick way. How do you prepare students for that kind of a future? There's an interest on that. There's a great book by Thomas Friedman. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for being late. So I really encourage you to have a look at that. Okay. Uh, I think he wrote that, published that a couple of years ago. But he mm. basically says that we've entered an age of accelerations, mm. uh, and things like AI is, is a terrific example of that. It is just going to get better and better, and yep. we can't actually keep up with that change, that rate of change. It's past our ability mm. to actually keep up. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can either be left behind as a result of that, mm -hmm. or we can embrace the opportunity and really rethink about how we educate young people. Yeah. Uh, we really have to, basically, yeah. because if it can do tax returns, if it can write code, if it can write essays, if it can yeah. produce videos, why are we teaching kids to how to do this? Mm. Well, what's the point of that? Mm. Uh, and it's going to transform jobs. It, yep. it already is. Like new jobs will emerge as a result of AI, and the jobs that emerge are going to be the jobs that AI can't replicate 100%. or robotics can't actually do. You can't automate them. Yep. Uh, so all of those sorts of jobs will disappear. And there's really high level jobs, professions like lawyers. Mm. Yeah, it's going to be able to do all of that legal grunt work behind the scenes. So Absolutely. all those clerical jobs uh, for lawyers particularly or surgeons even you know, lots of that in diagnosis of patients so what do we need to do to make sure that young people are employable the mm. skills and dispositions that young people need to have is around the ability to think creatively mm -hmm. think like an entrepreneur mm -hmm. think like an innovator mm -hmm. these are the sorts of things AI won't be able to replicate uh, and what makes us human as well so the emotional intelligence mm -hmm. you know, AI mm -hmm. hopefully won't be able to replicate that so mm. it what makes us human and what can we do that AI won't be able to do. This is what education should be doing. This mm -hmm. is where it needs to shift. Yep. Otherwise, as Thomas Friedman says, we're going to be left behind. Absolutely. We're going to be left in its wake. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's valuable advice. But at the moment, you know, in 2023, while we're recording this, people are still divided. And there are schools that are, and I'm not, I shouldn't say just schools, actually, universities and mm. schools are absolutely choosing left or right. right. And there yep. are people in the middle, not sure which side. What's your advice for them? And I can understand why they would do that, because mm. in a sense, it, it, it actually has taken them by surprise. They, they had no idea this was actually coming, so Absolutely. they weren't preparing for it. Uh, just to give you a bit of history of what we mm -hmm. did here, back in 2014, uh, we did a, what's called a scenario planning project. Uh, and we chose the year 2028. And what mm -hmm. we tried to do is to look at possible futures of what the world would look like yep. in the year 2028. We picked that year because it was when the younger students we had at the school, they were in pre-prep at the time, mm -hmm. would graduate from year 12. Uh, and to try and think about what those possible futures would look like, we interviewed some leading experts in a whole range of areas and did a lot of desk research. So we interviewed economists, politicians, people who are expert in technology, mm -hmm. education, the environment, all those areas. And we were looking for trends, mm -hmm. uh, trends that would impact the education of a young person here at St Paul's School. Yeah. Uh, we found 72 trends. We put them onto a video that we released uh, on YouTube, Did You Know That in 2028? Wow. Uh, and that's been viewed by 3 million people across the globe and Love used it. by General Electric in France to provoke their strategic wow. planning. Yep. The Business Council of New Zealand and other big corporates have used it as well. So we're really proud of that work. Yeah. Uh, but when we mapped those trends, we found two critical uncertainties. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those critical uncertainties was technology. Because mm. when you start looking at technology, 
you can't really predict more than three years out what it's going to be like. And it was a very different world even when you were starting that exercise, let alone yeah. now. Oh, precisely right. <laughs> but certainly in the era of technology back then, what we were seeing was scary stuff mm. like brain implants. So you do away with your phone yep, uh, yep. and you can actually download things directly to your neocortex. Now, if you think I'm talking science fiction, just Google Elon Musk and yep. brain implant and bigs. Mm -hmm. He's done it. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so if that's going to happen, it's kind of has this uh, view of the matrix where yep. you just sit in the matrix and download whatever you want. Mm. So if that's the case, then again, why are we educating young people? And I think that's a very uh, crucial point there because we were in North Queensland a few weeks ago and we had one of the students there. All they were talking about was exactly what you were just mentioning, yep. chips in the brain. And yep. he's wanting to be in the field and, and work in the field where they're putting chips in the brain. Yep. So obviously there's a big disconnect between what sometimes their students, uh, what they're hearing at school yep. and their teachers are saying and what they're Seeing wanting at to home. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And then the teacher at the school, no idea what's coming, Absolutely. like some of these schools around the country. Yep. And so not really preparing for that. Mm. The mm. other critical uncertainty we saw was the impact on employment. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And obviously AI and robotics is, is impacting the place of employment. So the question we asked is, well, if these four possible futures come to pass, hmm. then what is an education worth having? Yep. What are we preparing young people for? And I would argue ethically and morally, mm -hmm. if we're not preparing young people to live in this world mm -hmm. dominated mm -hmm. by AI, if mm -hmm. we're stuck back in this industrial re revolution of content delivery mm -hmm. and content reg regurgitation, then we're doing them a disservice. You know, we, we really have to rethink about how we're educating young people. Mm. Uh, mm. So that's yeah, where we're at. So schools who haven't actually thought about this, yeah, I can understand why they're, they're reacting from a place of fear mm -hmm. uh, and lack of understanding and appreciation. Mm -hmm. But it's not unlike the calculator. Well, you and I are too young to remember that. <laughs> no, <we laughs> I am calculator. as well. <laughs> True. But to the calculator, I'm sure, I've read uh, stories about that. When that was introduced in schools, yes. all these mathematicians were lamenting, going, it's going to destroy young people's ability to add up and you do all these computations. But, gee, it never disappeared, did it? Here it is. Uh, the mobile phone was introduced. Oh, mm. my goodness. <laughs> the internet. Oh, good grief. Yeah. Uh, yep. They're here to stay. We are going to have to adopt AI, mm. it is, or we're going to have to just go off grid, live on a remote island, and hope for the best that nothing ever happens to us. But, yeah. but that's the reality. Yeah. It's here to stay. We can't hold back the tide. Absolutely. So those schools have said no. Mm. They're going to have to find a way of actually addressing this issue, yeah. adopting it, and and hopefully they're wise enough to go. Let's capitalise this and stop and rethink what we're doing yeah. because what we've done is just not appropriate anymore. Fair, fair, mm. and. On the flip side, it, it's the responsibility of the educator, the teacher in front of the students every single day to guide them in that, in that methodology. What's your advice for teachers when you're thinking about the context of using these kinds of technology? Well, the interesting thing is you know, now, if you looked on LinkedIn or some of the social media platforms, a lot of people and teachers are putting out advice about how to use ChatGPT in the mm -hmm, classroom. Mm -hmm. So people have actually realised, yeah, we can't stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are actually developing some really great resources. So, for example, one of it, you know, I said at the beginning of the year, we're not going to ban this. Mm -hmm. you know, we can't. Right. We're actually embracing it because I'm super excited by it. Mm -hmm. It fits with our vision of what we've been doing. Uh, so go for your life. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, there's restrictions around it in terms of how old you need to be but you know we've got teachers who've set up an account and they're using it in their classroom mm -hmm. uh, they've used it to generate better questions that they might have been able to come up with to mm -hmm. provoke children's thinking or Absolutely. students thinking uh, they've used it for all sorts of things we had uh, the 730 report here interviewing me and a few kids a couple of weeks ago about chat mm. GBT and we actually put into it you know what questions might they ask mm. to help coach the kids and they came up with some cracking Love questions it. which were even better than what the interviewers <laughs> came with so <laughs> They were, really well prepared. <laughs> they were really well prepared. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. there are ways of integrating it. But again, it's that question that's frightened everyone. How do we assess them mm. to make sure they're not cheating? Yeah. And I think that's, that's the paradigm shift that needs to occur. Mm. We, we've got to stop thinking about assessment about what have you learned yeah. in terms of content? Yeah. And can you demonstrate me what you've learned? And we'll mark you on that. Mm. To moving assessment to what can you do with it? 
now you've got a grasp and a deep understanding of this content, what can you do with it? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. How can you use it to generate new ideas? Absolutely. Can you see connections between different curriculum areas? Mm. Uh, how can you actually uh, benefit that and grow that thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's well said because that's the rich learning experiences. Yeah. That's very practical in industry and when they go beyond school into their adult life, that's yeah. what's practical. Now, um, you mentioned a whole bunch of skill sets and that AI can't exactly replicate and yeah. the other niches. What are some of them? You've mentioned a few, but yeah. if, you, if you had to almost list them, what well, are some of the ones? Well, to list them, probably to give you the other back end of the story in terms of strategically what we did. So mm -hmm. we created those four scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we saw was that if we were to prepare young people to thrive in this world, mm -hmm. we needed to equip them with the ability to think creatively. Mm. Think like an innovator, think like an entrepreneur. I was hoping creative thinking is going to be exactly on the top of that list. Uh, it's definitely <laughs> on the top of that list. Perfect. Uh, and the irony is schools are really, really good at conditioning creative thinking out of young people's mm. minds. Mm. And yet it's a very skill that they need to have. Yep. Foundation for Young Australians a couple of years ago produced a report about the, the skills that people need to have to be employable in the future. Top of the list was creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically said that only 20% of the people have those skills. Uh, to go. fill those new jobs. Now yeah. that's that's frightening. Sir Ken Robertson, do skill uh, schools kill creativity? Mm. Pod, um, TED Talk he put out in two thousand six. Mm -hmm. Most watched TED Talk. Dead right. Yep. Gave us a challenge. How do we change what we do in classrooms to make sure we do teach for these dispositions and skills that mm. cause creative thinking to mm -hmm. occur? So we, that challenge and that problem, we did a lot of research, prototyping, testing, and we rolled out what we call realms of thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, realms of thinking uh, is essentially a collection of 16 dispositions mm -hmm. that are evidence-based that are necessary for creative thinking. Mm -hmm. So things like the ability to deal with ambiguity, the willingness to take risks and deal with failure, mm -hmm. empathy, collaboration, uh, all um, intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. So these dispositions need to occur for creative thinking to actually happen. So yep. we change the way teachers plan, we professionally develop them, so they're embedding those dispositions into the classroom, into their activity, mm -hmm. uh, and then the students are actually learning the language as well. And when you cluster those dispositions together in mm -hmm. different ways, interesting things happen, mm -hmm. like design thinking or entrepreneurial thinking. Uh, now, the ex even more exciting part about this is if we value skills and dispositions more than academic development, mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly, just as an aside, we did a survey with uh, our school community here, our parents, and most of them are employers themselves, mm -hmm. so running their own businesses and companies, and we asked them, when you're employing someone, what is more important? their character, mm -hmm. their skills and dispositions, or their qualifications. Mm -hmm. What do you think they rank number one? The second one. Skills and dispositions? Yep. No. Person? Yes. The person behind it. Yep. <laughs> they rank character as yep. number one. That's Makes what they're sense. looking for. Yeah. Close second with skills and dispositions. Yep. Qualifications would absolutely Distant be Distant third. Yep. So at the end of the day, isn't it all about helping young people get a job? Mm. It's not about helping young people get to university. Mm. It's mm. actually Preparing right. them for the future. Preparing them for the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so if we value these skills and dispositions and the development of character, why aren't we measuring them and reporting mm. on them? Uh, because you value what you measure and yeah. you measure what you value. Yeah. So we've been working with the Graduate School of uh, Melbourne University for the last two years mm -hmm. and they've been working with us to develop assessment rubrics mm. so we can actually assess a child's ability to think creatively wow. and report to their parents and to them yep. how they are developing these skills that will make them employable in the future. Yep. And we'll sit that on a learner profile on the blockchain. Uh, so it's there as a real credential. Yep. It'll be warranted by the Melbourne University. Uh, and then students can take that mm -hmm. warranted credential to an employer and say, if you're looking for someone who can uh, identify problems mm -hmm. in your company and look for opportunities to develop a new product line. I'm your person. Here's the evidence. Wow. This is what I can do. That's a do. game changer. It is a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what education needs to be about. So how yeah. do you achieve that kind of a thing? What You already mentioned blockchain. Yeah. There must be some sort of AI or 
what's the back end looking like? <laughs> That's the technical <laughs> Look, question I, that I love. I, I, the software guys are upstairs, <laughs> Richard, so I'm not going to be able to answer that well. Fair enough. But if we can answer more broadly, mm -hmm. uh, realms of thinking, if you think of that uh, as a way of teaching. Mm -hmm. So schools need to still deliver content. Mm -hmm. We have to teach the Australian curriculum. There's no two ways about it. Yep. This is not a on top of. Mm -hmm. This is an easy way for schools to change the way they teach. So they're still meeting their mandatory requirements to teach a particular curriculum. Mm -hmm. Kids still sit in that plan, they still get an ATAR, but this way of teaching really supports the development of creative thinking. Mm -hmm. It asks young people the question, what can you do with what you now know? Yep. And interestingly, it causes them to learn the content mm -hmm. on a much deeper level. So yep. their academic results improve Absolutely. while they're developing the skills and dispositions. So it's not creativity or academic development, it's both and. Mm. Uh, and that's the exciting thing. So the Realms of Thinking is a planning tool to mm -hmm. help teachers change the way they teach uh, to plan for creativity. It's a collaboration tool, mm -hmm. uh, so teachers can plan collaboratively. It's a teacher appraisal system, mm -hmm. so it gives teachers feedback about their practice and schools get data about what's happening in classrooms so they know where the good practices are occurring because yep. it's the quality teaching that it has the biggest impact on a student in a school. Mm. And then last of all, it's that learner profile that'll sit ultimately on the blockchain. This actually reminds away. me of a book called 2041. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure if you've, if you've read no, that I, one before. That one, yeah. it's, it's, I think you will enjoy it given what you've achieved here. Yeah. Um, simply because it's using and predicting the world what it will be in 2041. Yeah. Um, and predicting where the future of work will be, future yes. of education will be. And um, the education component naturally involves AI, as you would have yeah. thought. Um, and this is very much in a step towards that direction. Yeah. And um, for the listeners as well, I, I encourage them to listen to that book because it's, it's one of those wow books that yep. you it makes you think and this is a very practical application that you've yeah. achieved here so that's that's pretty awesome there's another great book ready player one have you seen oh, that, that one that's a movie yes oh, it sorry, is sorry it that was is a book. book that yeah. is a book now it's a, a movie. movie yeah yes. it's actually and the prescribed homework that i give to teachers when oh, we talk it? about technology <laughs> oh, so watch this movie. yeah and that's that's the uh the scary scary and exciting thing is mm. when we stop to look or read some of these books yeah, science fiction really is just the, the birth of an idea. Absolutely. So if you look at a science fiction movie and see, wow, that's amazing, that actually is just giving some of the idea to make that become a reality. Correct. That's That's where the idea is germinated. Yeah. Uh, and when you read some of these books and look at what's going on in the world, uh, Shaping Tomorrow uh, is a really good newsletter to yes. su yep. subscribe to too because it, it will send you a feed of what is happening in technology uh, and society as well. Mm. But when you start looking at that... Uh, it becomes overwhelming because yep. that rate of change is increasing, yep. but also causes you to think, well, I need to get ready for that. Yep. Uh, otherwise, yep. I'm going to be left behind. How do you find the students' approach towards AI and these kinds of learning applications? Students are much more adapted to adults. Yep. <laughs> so, Naturally, they're yeah, geared towards it. Digital natives. I mean, they're pretty excited. Anything yep. glossy and shiny, they're going to be in there straight away. And it is a term that I think I've, I've heard, glass generation. So anything with a glass surface, they yep. assume it's a touch screen. Yep. And just intuitively, that's all it they know. It is funny as you so, see little kids going, yeah. <laughs> doing not scrolling what's going on with yeah. this <laughs> up to the tv on the walls yeah. <laughs> so yeah the kids are they're not as afraid as what we are mm. it's same with any technology mm. kind of different generations obviously but my generation and older you know my parents for example are, you know, are frightened of technology i, I might break it whereas mm. a, a child bah, just give it to me let's, yeah. let's have yeah. a play and away yeah. we go so, and we used to read a manual yes too, before you started you know, any machine or plug yep. it in, you've got to read a manual, you've got to figure out how to set it up. Now it's plug and play. Yeah. It's and certainly when we did this uh, futures planning project uh, many years ago, I mean, my son was uh, just graduating. He was in year 12 and he, uh, I caught him in his bedroom one night on YouTube, mm -hmm. yeah, watching YouTube clips on physics because mm -hmm. he was doing physics. And I think, Alex, what are you doing, mate? And he said, well, this guy here teaches this concept better than the teacher at school. Wow. Uh, now, that was a scary thought for a headmaster. Absolutely. What's that teacher doing? Yeah. <laughs> go, but at the end of the day, these kids know how to achieve what they want to achieve. Mm. Uh, and most of their really good quality learning happens outside of school yeah. online yeah. Uh, when they're driven and motivated. Yeah. So yeah. we often say... And it's a double-edged sword. It because is. if they're not aware of where to go and find and, and use these platforms in an ethical yeah. way, the human quality way, they're 
easily going to be put in front of Precisely. misguided opinions. Yeah. yeah well. And that's one of the challenges that we saw in this futures planning project is mm -hmm. that whole ethical decision making piece. So character is so important in this new world. Yeah. Just because we can, should we? Mm -hmm. So schools should be more focused on not just the skills and dispositions necessary to think creatively, but also to make those decisions about the application of those new technologies. How do we make good, proper decisions so we're mm. benefiting humankind with these new ideas and innovations rather than seeking to destroy life as we know it? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. And uh, this is a very close to heart question because I'm, I'm part of the United Nations Queensland chapter and we constantly talk about the integration of SDG goals within uh, education. Yes. Yep. Um, is this something that you see a, or is it already a part of realms of thinking or how do you, how do you see that fitting in? Uh, to be honest, I haven't really pay close attention and looked at integrating those deliberately into realms of okay. thinking. But the teacher might be able to. The teacher yeah. probably would, but but, but you, you look at those sustainable goals, yeah. uh, certainly it underpins, well, the values are very similar to the values at St Paul's School. So we, we offer a holistic education. Our purpose as a school is to prepare resilient global citizens Perfect. who are innovative thinkers with a heart for servant leadership. Yeah. So the innovative thinking is all about realms of thinking helping them to think creatively. The servant leadership is all about helping them to apply their learning to make a positive difference to the communities in which they'll eventually live and work. So really about tackling some of those global issues like climate change or poverty or yep. uh, equality, or, or, yep. all those sorts of things. So it's about creating people who ha have the ethics, the capacity and the drive to actually make a positive difference to the communities in which they'll live and work. That's, that's my goal for a student here. Yep. It's not to get the best ATAR, it's to go out there and make the best difference. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think that's the most practical skill set that any human can yeah. get. So, All right, so in terms of advice to educators and schools, what's your last takeaway? Well, my last takeaway is I, I'm always frustrated, I know all educators are, that our schools are governed really by politics. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. has become a politicised game. And so governance, governments and the media tell us what we should be doing in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're criticizing teachers, saying obviously standards are falling across the country, it must be the fault of the teacher. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact, I think it's the fault of something much, much bigger than that. It's because we have changed our values mm. as a society. We mm. don't value in the West education as much as, much as we used to. Mm -hmm. The East values education much more highly. Mm -hmm. That's why they're doing incredibly well. Mm. You can't do anything different within the school because teachers are working yeah. really hard. Mm. Uh, and politics, unfortunately, keeps saying to get the votes, mm. uh, we need to go back to basics. Mm -hmm. uh, and sadly, that is not fit for purpose anymore. So teachers, I think, need to rise up, be confident in their own ability. Mm -hmm. They know all about this. They just don't know how to or they're frightened. Mm -hmm. So have the courage, teachers and schools. We did it. You can do it too. And if you're interested in seeing what we did, come and have a conversation with us. But mm -hmm. it, it's the grassroots movement that will cause the change. It's, we, yeah. we can't wait any longer for a politician to say, you know what, we've got to change because mm. they're only in the office for three years and they don't really care. <laughs> so we've got to rise up because we became educators because we want to make a difference. So let's together make a difference. And like you said, those educators, in uh, when you look outside of Australia, they value the teacher almost above. They're the best in society. Exactly. They're molding yeah. the future generation. So I, I really resonate with that. So I love that. Now, I always ask my guests a random question. So um, well, I've already said I support the blues. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've been there. We've done there that. Yeah. But um, we talked about Netflix and yeah. uh, we talked about some books. Yeah. What's your favorite Netflix show outside of the ones that we've talked about? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Put you on the spot To be there. honest, I'm not, I'm not a huge TV watcher. Oh, any, I, like, I do like Netflix. watching TV. doesn't have to be Netflix. Yeah, anything. I do. Anything. I, I like British Murder. Uh, okay. Yeah, which is pretty yep. good. Like Endeavour, final episode last night. That was great. Really enjoyed that. There you go. That, there so. you go. I might yeah. have to check that out. <laughs> yeah. Mate, that's been awesome. Uh, you shared a lot of very detailed things, and I think a lot of listeners need to hear that, given the majority of the teachers, uh, so the audience are teachers. Yeah. And, um, and I think what you've achieved here is incredible. The artificial intelligence alongside creative thinking coming together, and in the way that you've put it out there to the world, it's an exciting couple of years ahead. So right. Well, thank you for thank the you opportunity. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Lovely you. talking to you. Likewise. <laughs> That's it for today's episode. Now it's time to take action and build on the learnings to get inspired. 
First up, jump on to rashansenanayaka.com forward slash podcast and check out the show notes, links and other relevant learning materials from this amazing episode. Next, if you learned something new today, click that subscribe button and set yourself up to receive live notifications on future episodes, as well as more opportunities to learn from our amazing guests, brands and speakers. Last but not least, it's time to have your say. Join the conversation and share your thoughts and feedback on today's episode with a review, all while joining many others with a five-star rating for Inspiring Design with Rashan Senanayaka. Till next time.